happened in our rural areas. Without that, any mention to modernization, particularly a uh, modernization that includes uh, the agricultural sector, would be utopian. So I reiterate the need for intercooperation, developing a consortia in something that needs to be a transforming coalition to foster digitalization of our agriculture, to reach rural areas. Obviously, trying to uh, ensure no one is left behind. As a result of this forum, I believe a series of proposals have been arising. I would imagine, uh, or I would list six or seven that are possible point for points for our joint roadmap to develop this more modern, more resilient, or sustainable agriculture, particularly uh, more inclusive socially. The first issue is the need to extend the infrastructure, the connectivity, based on the existing and potential demand in rural areas. Here I see that Emmanuel is, uh, I don't know, I don't know, he's making funny faces at me. I don't know if he disagrees, I don't know. Uh oh no, no, I fully agree with what you are saying, Mr. Director General. But let me get ahead of you a bit. We have a very special tribute. The Director General, Dr. Manuel Lotero, has been leading an open door ICA through different projects and initiatives that aim to bring initiative, the ICA much closer to the communities, uh, rural communities, and all the people in the rural communities of the Americas. So as a tribute to this leadership of uh, Dr. Otero, we would like to uh, sh share with you a brief video, as I indicated a tribute uh, to him. Thank you, to this effort, thank you. Very well. To continue with the agenda today, allow me to introduce the Vice Minister of Science and Technology and Telecommunications, Mr. Teodoro Willink Castro. Mr. Willink Castro, Vice Minister, has a master's in electrical engineering with emphasis in networks and telecommunications from the University of Twente, the Netherlands, a licensee in electrical engineering with emphasis in communication systems from the University of Costa Rica and a bachelor's in electrical engineering with emphasis in electronics and telecommunications from the University of Costa Rica. The vice minister will be the moderator for this panel and I offer him the floor. Thank you, Emmanuel. Welcome everyone. Both uh, all the different participants in this forum, as well as uh, the viewers, all the people that have joined us today. Don Emanuel and uh, all the different uh, people here from ECA. It is a pleasure for me to participate in this forum at this time as a moderator, because the work to a bridge the digital divide, particularly in rural areas. I mean, all I can do is coincide 
This is fundamental for the economic reactivation and development of Latin American and Caribbean countries. And therefore, it is uh, quite an honor to be here with you, not just participating, but also sharing with the entire team, a luxury team that is with us today, consisting of uh, Luca Maria Pesando, Claudia Rossler, Claudia Carvajal, Pedro Martel, and Rolando Flores. Just as this is a Latin American and Caribbean forum with people from a, a different, we have people from different areas with different views, and this is going to be a very enriching discussion. Before we begin the discussion, allow me to mention that this is the fourth session. This is called uh, Elements for a Joint Roadmap, but at the same time, it is a first step or the, the, the beginning of the process uh, that continues to occur now. So the, we are just uh, starting to chart our roadmap, thinking of what we should do, what we need to change to begin to think of such uh, digital transformations and bridging uh, divides. So to start with, we would like to hear the opinion of our different speakers for the day. Basically, if you're hearing about their experiences and in their experience, what are the key elements that we should move towards to, the, to bridge this rural digital divide and tap advantages of digital uh, agriculture in Latin America and the Caribbean? We would also like to hear about the three priority actions that we should address jointly to move forward. And this is very important because this begins to pinpoint and allows us to highlight or, or prioritize concrete actions. So I will firstly offer the floor to Luca Maria Pesando, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the Center for Population Dynamics at the, uh, the McGill University. And he has a PhD in demography and sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's in economic science and social sciences from the University of Bocconi. He is co-author of a paper, gender, Rural Digital Gender Gap in Latin America and the Caribbean, developed by ICA University of Oxford. I bet. So, Luca, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me today. I was lucky to get to know all of you about six months ago when we started collaborating on a report. And uh, that was a real pleasure. And um, it also a lot gave me the opportunity to get to know this topic more because as uh, Teodoro just mentioned, I have a PhD in uh, demography and sociology. So my primary areas of interest are the study of the family and how families and schools interact with each other to somehow shape students' uh, life trajectories. So this is a topic that I started working on uh, later on in my research career, but it's also one that I find very fascinating. And uh, now I have lots of co-authors who are interested in digital divides in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're working on several directions to try to answer some of the questions that are discuss today uh, here with you. So again, thank you for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity. I actually speak Spanish quite well, but I never speak Spanish academically or for work. I just do it in my house. So today I'll try to stick uh, to English if, uh, if it's not a problem for you. As long as there is interpretation, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, so going to the, to the first question that, that you raised, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a faculty member, I'm a professor, so I, I always try to think about schools and what schools can do uh, to somehow tackle this issue of the rural digital divide and gender digital divide, which are two interconnected issues. So I think one of the, I mean, we were talking about the elements that could be key elements to uh, bridge these divides. I think the first one and a very important one would be to develop uh, to think about and develop educational interventions in schools that uh, help to spread digital knowledge, because we know that that is the first barrier 
that most people don't really have the knowledge and this knowledge needs to be conveyed already in schools. So, of course, teachers have a big, a big uh, role here and a big influence uh, in spreading digital knowledge and digital skills. And this is something that should already start in schools. So we might discuss later on what could some of these interventions be, but I think some interventions might exist that might boost digital skills of students and particularly so in uh, rural areas, which is what we're talking about here today. And um, the second element which I thought about uh, is somehow of a system that allows students to move more directly from schools to the, to the job market. So uh, let's think about school to work transitions. This is usually a very complicated path in students' lives. And as long as we manage to convey some of these digital skills in schools, I think what's essential is to devise strategies and programs that allow the students to translate and convert these digital skills into the job market, and in this case, into agriculture. So what are some of the skills that the students learn in schools that can be adapted into, uh, into agriculture? And uh, I'm talking a lot about youth because I think youth here is central and we should start by investing in youth and investing into digital skills targeted to youth and make sure that the knowledge learned in school actually translates into actionable uh, work in agriculture. Uh, not just in agriculture, but today's focus is on agriculture. So I think devising uh, programs that allow students to transition into work in agriculture by leveraging their digital skills is something that is actionable and is uh, somehow not that complicated to achieve. And the third um, element instead, which is rather complicated and which we talked a lot about in our report, uh, which was published in October, has to do with the digital gender divide, which is a very complicated issue because it typically hinges upon uh, cultural specificities and gender norms, which are very hard to change. So I think in this case, it's much harder to think about policies and interventions that might change digital gender divides and how girls and boys use dig digital technologies or have access to digital technologies differently, but it's definitely something that is at the core of the issue of the rural gender divide, of the rural digital divide. So I think the gender digital divide and the rural digital divide are highly interconnected. So if we wanna solve one of these two issues, we need to think about how, so, how to solve the other issue, which is very much complementary. Uh, so these were uh, these are the three elements, key elements that I would uh, suggest, and that we can further expand on in the discussion afterwards. And instead, can, uh, should I go directly to the second question, or should we first uh, move to the other speakers and then go back to the second question? No, si le parece, Luca, terminemos también con la segunda. Luca, let us finish with the second question also, and then we can move to the other speakers. Okay, thank you. on actions, on specific actions, on specific policies is definitely a challenging one, but uh, I think there are some strategies that are more cost effective than other. And um, I think the first one is for sure investing in infrastructure. And when I'm talking about infrastructure here, I'm not just talking about digital skills. I'm actually talking about roads. I'm talking about bridges. I'm talking about all the type of physical infrastructure that makes it such that uh, producers are better able to communicate with their peers, with local authorities, with institutions. So physical infrastructure is essential for communication to flow. And this is ultimately a precondition for technological progress. So as long as there is no physical infrastructure, there's not going to be technological progress and there's going to be a lag in digital technologies, especially so in rural areas, which tend to be uh, very remote compared to urban areas. So I would say point one is boosting infrastructure. Uh, point two uh, is also essential and I think and I think it has to do with reducing the, the cost of technology. There's often the claim that, for instance, smartphones or mobile phones are not uh, very expensive devices. They are really, uh, yeah, they're not that expensive so people can uh, achieve or can use mobile phones easily. But that's not really the case 
everywhere. And often what is more expensive than the mobile phone itself is having good connectivity. So we know that having mobile phones without having good connectivity doesn't really help, doesn't really help. So what matters is having good connectivity and hence ensuring cheaper technology and connectivity options would boost uh, access and use of digital technologies. Uh, in this case, I'm thinking, for instance, about big companies such as Google, Facebook, or Amazon, which could offer financing, financing to help uh, lower income earners to afford new technology and high level connectivity. I also think that the governments, to the extent possible, this is not always possible, could uh, give some tariff subsidies to encourage uh, produce, uh, producers to buy and use these digital tools. So uh, point one, infrastructure. Point two is reducing the cost of technology. And point three is definitely empowering users to use this technology. This goes back to the issue of uh, knowledge, uh, which is often referred to as the second level digital divide. So not just having access to, no to technology, but being able and knowing how to use this technology. And I think this is an issue, especially in rural areas, because uh, often some of the content that is available is only available in some language, for instance, whilst in some rural areas, uh, people might be using different languages and the content that they can access online is not available in their own language. So let's say making some content available in the local language could be already something that gives people in rural areas or in remote areas access to some information that they would not otherwise have. So this would be one way of empowering uh, most disconnected uh, users to be able to access information that is available online. Uh, I, yeah, I have many other suggestions, but I will stop here to give everyone the opportunity and then we can uh, reconnect afterwards. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Luca. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. How important, how fundamental the skills are in the second level of this digital divide that you mentioned that has been some, uh, it's, it has been sort of like an afterthought to access in Costa Rica. So it is worth highlighting this very, very, very worthwhile. Now allow me the floor, allow me to offer the floor to Claudia Russler. She is Director of Agriculture at Microsoft, uh, Manager of uh, Azure Global Engineering. She has been working on innovation and digital technology in the agriculture and food area. She helps organizations to ensure growth through digital solutions, enabled uh, by data and advanced analyses. Claudia joined Microsoft in 1992 in Munich, Germany. She is part of the board of directors of Age Growth International. She is venture partner for Radical Growth, and she is also part of the Women's Advisory Council for Food and Agriculture. Claudia, welcome. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Iika for inviting me and being part of such an honorable group of people here today. Um, yeah, I, you know, I want to dive right into the first question you ask about the digital divide and, and sort of how this can be overcome and really laser focus on the technology perspective here. But there's like four areas I want to talk a little bit about today. One, um, Luca also touched on, uh, actually two of them is uh, access to technology then the infrastructure for data analytics, the importance of skilling and education, and then lastly, innovation. So those are the four areas I wanna to touch on today. Um, connectivity truly is fundamental. I think this whole forum, the whole event brought it up all the time. Uh, farmers are not able to participate in digital innovation if there is no rural connectivity or access to simple things like mobile phones. So uh, that's, definitely an area that needs to be addressed. And this is a, a something we'll talk more about uh, between technology, uh, public and private, where uh, we can certainly make progress. Um, then once you have the connectivity, it's really about establishing this digital infrastructure. And I think it's important to call that out here that obviously digital infrastructure has a different meaning if you have a thousand hectare farm in Brazil or if you're a small hold of farm in Guatemala. So in uh, what I wanna say, it's 
often overseen how much improvement can be done for smallholder farming with technology, which is not obvious because how would a smallholder farmer uh, be able to participate? So it's very important that we find ways to aggregate data and we find uh, organizations that have an interest in aggregating data and helping to analyze it to provide insights to farmers. So this is not about one farmer alone taking advantage of technology. There's much that can be seen and insight that can be derived from satellite image data, from weather data, but it needs this aggregation and analysis and then uh, being able to um, compare across multiple farms to really provide um, insight back to the farmers. The promise really here is to improve the decision making and this decision making on the farm then has impact both on the productivity and the sustainability and with that also on the livelihood for the farmers. So I think that's very important. And Luca talked about this importance um, around digital skilling and the whole new generation of farmers coming. And I actually think there is a moment in time because a lot of agriculture in the past was about tribal knowledge and being very knowledgeable about what you're doing in the farm. So there's always what we see on the technology side, a little bit of a resistance to believe in technology and follow uh, guidance with this new generation of farmers coming. Um, I, there's, a, there's an opportunity to support that with skilling, with technology and provide insight. And there's fantastic work that EECA does today uh, with their, uh, you know, the, the center where of interpretation of tomorrow's agriculture, where you can learn and, and really get familiar with new practices. There's video training that's done in different languages. This is about going out to universities and teach you know, uh, students about uh, the new phase of agriculture. I think it's important work because what I'm seeing, and this is from a global perspective, that it's also not as attractive to work in agriculture anymore. So hopefully with all those activities, we can make it more attractive to take a role in agriculture in the future and really show the difference um, in, in how future agriculture looks like. Now, the last piece is also important because innovation is such an important thing for agriculture and every crop is different, every region is different, every climate condition is different. So it takes an army, so to say, of researchers and academia that's working jointly on developing all the necessary models around disease predictions, pest predictions, smart irrigation. So we really see the need to democratize AI in building out a platform that's allowing others to uh, build those models on top of it and provide it back into the community. Um, so with that, I wanna talk a little bit about the three priorities and really I wanna give it a little bit of spin and how we see it from a Microsoft perspective, how we contribute to that today. Uh, it obviously starts with connectivity again, uh, because uh, that that is really without that, like I said, there's no innovation possible. We have the Microsoft Airband team that has this goal to bring internet connectivity to 40 million uh, households uh, globally. And I know they work really uh, um, strong together with EECA and other organizations to help change leg legislation, help to get other um, companies and organizations to contribute and also uh, finance some of the um, internet connectivity. They work with IS, ISPs to provide local networks. So that's uh, fundamental work in that uh, space. Then it it's really about this data aggregation I was talking about earlier. In Microsoft, we have this uh, platform that we call FarmBeats that's taking this recurring and, and to be honest, also difficult task of collecting data that's coming from farm and that's coming from the environment and bring it into a format where others can build their digital solutions on top of it. I think that's going to be super important to speed up uh, the how quickly uh, applications and digital solutions can be built in the regional areas and that allows other market participants like uh, insurances banks like input providers to build 
digital solutions on top of such a platform. I, I do think there is a need that the risk of farming is taking a bit off the shoulders of farmers and uh, that private organizations need to play a role in, um, in helping to provide this digital insight and analytics insight to farmers. So I think we'll see whole new models and we see this uh, starting from you know, banks that provide advice to farmers and with that um, provide better loan conditions, uh, just as one example out of a lot of more that we're going to see. And then lastly, this is really about uh, what I talked before is, is democratizing uh, the development of digital models. Uh, we have an initiative that's called AI for Earth, which is uh, providing grants and support to researchers, academia, uh, uh, to build out those digital models and provide it back into the industry so it can be reused and further evolved um, by other organizations and by other researchers. So hopefully this helps to speed up innovation in a way that it's needed to address all the different challenges that we're seeing in agriculture. Claudia, muchas gracias. Qué Thank interesante. you very much, Claudia. Very interesting and valuable to hear from your perspective and to include smallholders, projecting them collectively. Um, finding a way to demo, demo, democratize our technologies. I think this is really important if we're talking about Latin American agriculture, where we have so many small farmers. I would now like to give the floor to Claudia, Claudia Carvajal Morelos for 10 minutes. Claudia is country director and interim regional director for Latin America for Precision Agriculture for Development, PAD. In her position, she is the lead of the strategy to expand services for digital, personalized digital extension of PAD in the region. Claudia has led operations for PAD programs in the state of West Bengal and in India and Bangladesh, and she has led research activities to improve the impact of PAD services in the region. Just as a reminder again, we have two questions. The first one is, in your experience, what are the key elements towards we should towards the ones we should move to bridge the digital divide and make use of opportunities for digital agriculture in Latin America and the Caribbean? And second, what are the three priority actions to jointly cover and be able to progress? Welcome, Claudia. You have the floor. Thank you very much for that introduction, Teodoro, and thank you to Ica for that invitation. That's uh, precisely why we work, so I'm really glad to be here. The first question uh, regarding key elements to bridge the digital divide, I think in many ways my answer is similar to what we've already heard. It's necessary to improve quality of infrastructure in rural areas. Increasingly, the rural population has access to mobile phones, uh, and sometimes you can just get SMS and it's 2G. But there is also a great divide in connectivity, even more so for internet services. We can do many things, improving institutional frameworks to incentivize public and private investment. These sectors may be less profitable if you just look at it financially and economically, but there is a great social impact. So we should find the resources or the mechanisms to ensure resources can reach them. Another challenge is the high cost of telecommunication services. I've lived in India for several years and now coming back to Latin America, the difference in costs even if you adjust it for parity of uh, acquisitive power or purchasing power, it's very high. We need to ensure that these services are more affordable for rural areas. The second point is also something we heard, digital literacy for the rural population. Latin America has the advantage that the literacy rates are quite high for traditional literacy and for um, digital literacy, it, it's growing, but there's still a large part of the population that does not truly know how to use a phone as efficiently. So they cannot reach so many services or um, 
register for certain programs. And this is basic to ensure they can adopt the uh, digital tools. Some of the context of what we do in PAD is to provide digital extension tools at very low cost through cell phones. So a prerequisite to provide the services is for people to be able to use a phone. And it's very interesting because we knew that the digital literacy was very important, but then we have the pandemic and that completely transformed the way we live our lives. It showed that not having access or not knowing how to use digital media and technology widens the gap in rural population or people living in poverty versus those who are not. And so it creates a larger divide. And the last point is adopting and promoting, promoting interventions that have a gender approach. Um, all of these interventions are increasing. We've already heard about the rural and digital, uh, rural and urban digital divide, but then there's also the gender gap. And it's not just um, thinking about how to train women, but also the types of services we can provide that can be of benefit for women and without uh, changing the way families interact. For example, women traditionally in Latin America and in many parts of the world have greater uh, responsibilities in the home. So we have to think about how these programs are uh, performed so that we don't create an imbalance in that additional burden at home and to ensure that they can take action. And also access to digital tools uh, for women and interventions to empower women which can later lead to greater uh, or better dynamics in the home, less uh, power asymmetries. These are some of the necessary conditions to reduce that gap as well. Now, as for priority actions, so the second question, in my opinion, the first thing is to develop and implement digital programs that can be adapted to the needs of the rural population. There's a tendency in the world to think about programs that are aspirational in the sense that we cannot really implement them, but this would be great to bring to the population. But I think we have to truly understand what we can do now, what we can actually do for current services. There's great interest to develop um, services for internet and smartphones, but in truth, in Latin America, we still have great differences in penetration of smartphones. And a large uh, number of the population has access to just very simple phones. So SMS and voice messaging would probably be the first logical step before thinking about internet later on. And uh, precision agriculture for development, our idea, uh, is to be able to apply it to different sectors. So we're talking about agriculture, but we'd like to also bring it to other areas such as education. And also uh, making use of the opportunities and challenges we have because of the pandemic to continue developing digital solutions. So the pandemic revolutionized our world. It uh, really gave greater importance to anything digital. So again, that led to a greater divide. There's been many programs trying to reduce the digital divide, but so now that we've started this, we have to use the momentum and continue building based on everything we have achieved during the pandemic. It has been a great challenge for humanity, but it has also served as an opportunity to understand the importance of digital tools. And lastly, investing in digital literacy. Digital illiteracy is a great barrier for optimal use of digital services. If we invest in digital literacy, we can help the rural population overcome their challenges to truly use tools effectively. That way, programs can reach people in remote areas or even conflict areas, which are common in some countries of Latin America. And we believe that the cost benefit 
uh, ratio will improve as the rural population relates to these services and makes better use of them. And of course, low cost services for them. So those are some ways of uh, bringing it forward. Thank you, Claudia. It's a great proposal to see also how what you're suggesting on gender approaches echoes on what Luca has already said and also helping women deal with their uh, burdens at home that sometimes are not symmetrical in Latin America. So it's important to think that uh, this will not necessarily be a horizontal strategy. It has to be custom fit. So it's truly interesting to hear. And of course, the idea of looking at the pandemic uh, in ways we can learn from it or use it because it has brought some opportunities as well. It's a nurturing perspective. And it helps with our view to the future. Thank you, Claudia. Now we have Pedro Martel was a licensiate in agriculture from the University of San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and he has a master's degree in economics and a PhD in agricultural economics from the from Michigan State University. And since 2016, he's been the head of the Environmental Division and Rural Development and Disaster Risk Management Division of the AADB. He started with the AADB in 1988 as a research assistant in the Natural Resource Division. His work was focused on Central America, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. Pedro, welcome. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Minister, and greetings to everyone. Thank you, Emmanuel and Manuel, for your invitation. I had a presentation, but I think I won't share it. I think it's uh, more personal to just uh, speak, and I will just look at my notes. And when Rolando uh, is to speak, uh, he will have a great challenge because we're all mentioning quite similar aspects. So I'm trying to add value to what uh, I want to bring. First, I think that we all know about the digital divide. We have the figures uh, that clearly show the differences in Latin American rural and urban areas after AICA and the IADB uh, created the index on significant connectivity, I think is what the study called it, looking at connectivity data, but also quality of access. It's only 37% for Latin America. So that already gives you a certain mindset that there is a strong aspect of the digital divide here, as we've heard today and in past sessions. But very importantly as well, as Luca mentioned, it's not just a matter of digital connectivity. It's a, a matter of all kinds of access uh, two things that people need in rural areas to be more efficient in how they use their resources. So that's always something we've also discussed in Latin America for many years, how to close gaps in all the necessary services that can help the rural economy better develop more competitively and efficiently. However, digital topics do have an advantage over more physical aspects which is the virtual side that does not require physical presence. With that, if you look at the figures and studies that have uh, been published, there's a great impact. And the percentage of growth in the penetration of broadband is linked to 3.1% higher GDP or un lower unemployment. It's important because then you already see that there are some associations telling you it's worth it. It's not just a group of people that have an agenda for digitalization, but there are data showing an impact. I thought Claudia might refer to this as she has uh, done so on previous occasions on how the impacts of digitalization uh, can be seen. 
But then this brings us to a discussion with ministries. And I have the public sector perspective, the ministries of planning, ministries of finance, telling them it's necessary to invest from the public side on these matters. We need to close the gap because there is a true economic impact. We have to remember that when we talk about these matters. So what would be the key elements? First, I, I would like to say that there are some overarching elements for all um, of connectivity that have already been mentioned. Governance, public-private governance is uh, very important. How the public sector should engage with the private sector to ensure digitalization towards rural areas. That's truly important. Along those lines, I'm sure the vice minister is more aware of this, there's all the regulation um, associated to this. It allows or does not allow the development of certain investments. And this is truly vital from the public sector point of view, but also trying to see how to create private investment. Then we have coverage, another vital aspect. It's different from institutionality, and it refers to what has already been mentioned by previous speakers. But then there's also something else we should not forget from the public point of view. And that's my experience, where I come from the public sector, adaptability. If you think about uh, digitalization or technological development, anything you can think of, apps and knowledge sharing, etc. It goes at a speed that's much faster than the capacity that the state has to respond many times. And so we need to think about this because if not, what happens is, again, going back to my own experience, I design a project, design an investment, and we say, this is how we'll do it. When you start implementing the project, technological development is 10 years ahead or more from the original design. So again, we need to be agile and adaptable so that we can use resources efficiently and truly take advantage of digitalization. So those are the overarching themes. Now, something similar to what we've heard from previous speakers, I'll refer to the applications in the rural area. I believe if we consider the elements we need to remember is we have to prioritize simple cost-effective solutions. And this is related to what Claudia mentioned, not just trying to do things that are very complex, Working with SMS is very important and it's really easy. It's cost effective. It has a high return. I won't bore you with the figures. I have them here in front, but we do need to think about cost effectiveness, simple solutions. They can truly mean a leap in the types of investments we are conceiving when thinking about a digital agenda for a country. Don't just think about sophisticated things. Uh, during meetings, Mr. Sotomayor of ECLAC mentioned this WhatsApp group for simple trade channels. This works. These can be things that are interesting for public policy, how to encourage this type of simple solution. Also, adjusting to local needs and being inclusive, as we heard from others, gender issues, indigenous populations, Afro-descendant populations and their needs, and uh, seeing what services these populations are requiring. We need to consider how these groups use their time. How do women use their time, for example? What does it mean? Uh, for a woman to have certain responsibilities in the rural world and what would be a digital solution for her. So we absolutely need to consider this as a key element, adjust to local needs and be inclusive. And then promote development of all the digital aspect that can be environmentally sustainable and resilient to climate change. This is not just a discourse, it's a reality the use of digital technologies, the digital agenda and public investment in these uh, aspects is absolutely essential to better plan the use of natural resources, the environment, and to promote and suggest public policies along these lines. So you might think, okay, these are key elements. And so priority actions should be aligned to those. 
it's a different angle only trying to promote the adoption of ICTs in family agriculture, as we heard from Claudia Rossler. Think about smallholders, what we need to do, what types of technologies we need to work on with them. We have examples of some of the things we're doing that we did not do before. In the past three years in our investment programs for agricultural development, we are seeing strong needs to work on these types of things in El Salvador, Dominican Republic, in Uruguay, we have loans for investment that have specific components for this. And here I have to highlight the importance of simple tools for technical assistance and uh, for capacity building. And capacity is not just for producers, but also for those who are providing assistance, for those who are creating knowledge. Many people don't know how to use technology to transfer knowledge to others. And this is not a minor issue because, again, we have a large gap. Establishing mechanisms for dialogue between producers and others with ICTs. The public sector here could be a facilitator so that developers can talk to consumers or producers talk to consumers when there's not enough information to bring them together and solve any asymmetries in information. It, it was really interesting to hear Claudia talk about a subsidy for investment in the initial costs for apps. I have it in my notes. I never thought I would hear someone from the private sector mention something like that, but it is absolutely fundamental. It's a matter of the public and the private sector. We have to do it from the initial cost of investment. Somehow we have to cover that risk so that we can truly bring these technologies. And then quite quickly, using teledetection data in the rural areas for everything related to planning and natural resources. Um, there's an important role there for institutions such as AICA and the Inter-American Development Bank as uh, uh, facilitators and enhancers, um, helping government and private sector come together in a regional agenda. Again, we have the figures there, the information is available. So how can we uh, assemble regional platforms. And it's something easy to say, not so easy to do. But again, an institution like AICA can come in there to work as a facilitator. And likewise, we have some examples of things we're doing in some countries where we are already applying teledetection and other types of remote sensors to have investments in our projects. And finally, again, from the agricultural sector, digitalization to ensure that all the value chain processes are more cost effective. I'm thinking about digital government here. It's not much use to talk about all these things if a government continues working only with paper. There's really shocking figures here. There's little investment in digital government uh, overall. Just some countries, you can say, are at the forefront, others are lagging. And there, it's not just a central government. And uh, if you look at digital purchases, but even the agricultural sector itself, there's no digital government for the agricultural sector that is developed fully to provide more agile services for producers and private agents that are part of the value chain. And there is a series of aspects. Uh, if you start dreaming, well, we'll work with blockchain. Blockchain will help us work with the uh, land, property rights, and others. These are solutions that, uh, again, are related to digitalization and how to have a digital value chain. That's it on my part, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Pedro. Very interesting. I'd like to highlight the fact that you're looking for simple, cost-effective solutions. For us, um, some of the ideas we have here is that 5G is not necessarily for all, or it does not have to be available immediately for all. Uh, sometimes the, the latest or the newest technology can certainly help, but we need to build upon something safe and mature first. And then, of course, 
digital government, what you've mentioned, uh, goes along with digital literacy, as we heard from Claudia as well, to be a digital citizen. And these are complement, complementary. So it's important to have them work jointly. Thank you very much. And now we have Mr. Rolando Flores Galarza, who is the Dean and Main Administrative Officer of the uh, Department of uh, Agricultural Sciences and Consumer Sciences of New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, USA. Mr. Rolando has a PhD in Science and Industry of Cereals, uh, specializing in international trade from Kansas State University, a master's in, in agricultural engineering of Iowa State University, and a graduate of mechanical engineering in the University of Costa Rica. Welcome, Mr. Rolando, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Teodoro. It's a pleasure to join you. And thank you so much to EICA through its director, Mr. Manuel Otero, for his invitation. I have to also thank my collaborators in preparing the content for my presentation, Dr. Mario Alegre and the PhD student, Sara Torres. I'm talking from a university outside of Latin America, but in the context uh, of strong cultural ties between New Mexico and Latin America. To summarize, I will have to, I guess, summarize everything we've heard from previous speakers. It's been a wonderful forum. But I'll have to share some thoughts and, and also some recommendations following the structure of the two questions. And to keep the time, I will follow my notes over here. So I'll go directly to it. In Latin America, such as uh, some rural areas of New Mexico and the United States, access to digital technology is not just limited, it's irregular and the quality varies in rural areas. This lack of access requires significant investment in infrastructure through convergence of public policy and participation of the private sector to close the digital divide. This lack of access has also come up as a barrier to adopting new technologies. And it's also a barrier for the use and ownership of internet by communities. We should mention that right now the legislature in New Mexico has three bills of law to address this issue. Another limit to access is related to human capital, the skills and capacities to understand and use the connectivity technology available, especially in small family agriculture with differences in age and gender. We have to strengthen training of human resources with content to train in new available technologies, as well as promoting sensitive applications that can be adapted to the cultural context, including local languages and dialects, and paying special attention to the existing levels of education in rural areas. Therefore, it's important to understand the, the digital divide has to be addressed as a source of inequality. Therefore, bridging that divide has to be done in a way that includes local communities. The use of smart technologies requires certain skills and qualifications for workers that we don't necessarily have in rural areas. And if they are left behind, uh, are finally disempowering local communities. If we incentivize the use of new technologies, we have to think about public policies that can help regulate who and under what circumstances will be getting information from agricultural producers, which are key to protect the interests of individuals in rural communities. While farmers and producers carry the risks of production, as we've heard before, and the impacts to their livelihood, the benefits of the data produced by digitalizing are common, commonly capitalized by companies that handle these data. We have to acknowledge that there's an increased complexity and interconnectivity of problems. There's an interdependence 
economically, socially, politically, technologically, socially, and environmentally, in a context of profound global change. This transforms realities with implications for a common shared agenda. The digital divide is a multi-factor, multi-dimension phenomenon. Currently, those who adopt technologies first are those who have competitive advantages in the market. So where and when new technologies are applied can also change how useful they are. So access to information can be a catalyst to accessibility and globalization. From an academic standpoint, we consider three priority actions to address jointly. Based on the experience of NMSU, the university I represent, the three basic components to progress towards closing the digital divide are education, extension, and research. The three pillars of universities of land-grant universities in the United States. NMSU has developed a process to focus, prioritize, and specialize its efforts, concentrating main activities to avoid dispersal and to have applied technologies that can have greater impact in the productive, productive sector with an emphasis on added value for food chains. Our university has prioritized in the past years artificial intelligence with an integrated approach from different disciplines and schools. This is a critical point because here in New Mexico, there are very serious problems because of a lack of labor. It's also a, a large territory, the fifth largest state in the United States and semi-arid given its local, localization and uh, characteristics, social and environmental, as well as the institutional and educational trajectory, NMSU has a great opportunity. It's a university that's part of a series of universities that can help become a, an opening door for scientific and technological programs in the United States, actively participating in collaborative efforts to cooperate in productive development and the well-being of rural communities in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the United States. To close the digital gap, if we talk about education, we need to develop digital skills that help take ownership and use infrastructure and digital solutions to improve quality of life. Also having postgraduate master's degrees and others on agri digital agriculture and training to ensure empowerment. We have to complement all this education and academic training with the promotion and inclusion internationally, bringing participants to understand the complexities of globalization. Second, for extension and outreach services, these are a vehicle to transfer technologies. The aim is to increase stability, productivity, and to bring greater transparency to agricultural and industrial chains, as well as more access to social services such as education and healthcare. We should say that right now in the United States, the percentage of the population that works in agriculture is 1.8 to 2%, and the extension services has been have been vital. From the end of the 1800s, that this has had a great impact on agriculture. It's also necessary to adapt and develop uh, methodologies for specific contexts of Latin America and the Caribbean, considering any similarities for covering broad areas that are related to the agricultural sector, especially focusing on marginalized groups to ensure equality and inclusion. Third, we must invest in education, particularly in the innovative technologies, artificial intelligence for the for agriculture, such as those presented by NMSU related to monitoring livestock through uh, real-time tracking and sensors to improve productivity and animal well-being, robotics applied to monitor in real time, abiotic soil stress, and plants for uh, 
oh, uh, water management and irrigation together with sustainable agriculture, as well as the application of AI to identify patterns of behavior that will allow to develop long-term interventions and adapt plants and animals to the changes through integrated agro agroecological systems. Parallelly, the, the development and adoption of new technologies to give greater value added to agricultural products is a priority. This value added must focus not only on technologies, but also on non-traditional products and new varieties of agricultural products. In conclusion and in ending, from the perspective of NMSU, aside from improvements in physical infrastructure to bridge the digital divide, we need integrated strategies, interinstitutional, multidisciplinary strategies that will build synergies to foster digital development in rural territories with instruments and content to strengthen capacity building, minimizing the digital divide to better respond to the more greater growing demands of the industrial sector. We need to develop proposals for joint programs to focus on capacity building from different institutional stances. Connectivity as a complex and multifactorial component requires internet access, but also to train human resources to take part in the sophisticated digital age nowadays. Lastly, the, the seeking to close the digital divide must be based on a, a prospecting demands for small, from small producers, family producers, indigenous populations, youth and women, and listen and understand their needs and specific expectations so as to better respond when developing joint proposals. Otherwise, by leaving these marginalized groups behind, the process to bridge the gap will be another factor leading to greater inequality. It is timely to highlight the willingness of the uh, 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 New Mexico State University to give continuity to these additional efforts regarding digital agriculture and develop proposals for collaborative activities within the framework of the MOU between NMSU and DECA focused on shared priorities and areas of common interest. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so very much, Rolando. How important to hear about the role of universities and the interaction between research, extension, and even education. At that at universities, at least, we, we see these activities converge. And that precisely is where we can project all of this to rural areas to bridge this gap, divide. Thank you so very much for your comments, all, each and every one of you. Allow me now to take advantage of the fact that we have a bit more time today to uh, open up the discussion. I would like perhaps to invite you to I don't know, improvise some other comments this time. I, I have a few questions here, but allow me to begin by asking Claudia, Claudia Rustler, what is the experience of articulation between the private sector and the public sector to foster digital technologies in groups that have been excluded? Not only how has it been, but how should it be to project this into the future? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this gives me an opportunity to uh, react to some of the things I heard after I talked. Uh, uh, this was an amazing session, by the way. Um, I think I want to come back to the first point about technology, and Claudia brought this up, doesn't have to be complicated to have a huge impact. And uh, she mentioned the importance of having simple things like mobile phones. And sometimes people don't even know how to use mobile phones. And I think it's such a, I want to just repeat the importance about uh, those programs being specific to a country and work for the local conditions. And we have uh, done projects where in India, um, 
10 text messages were able to improve uh, yields by 30%. And, you know, we then learned that not everyone can read. So we, instead of sending te text messages, we called farmers in their local language. So I think it's really important to go to the edges what's needed. I think that's one thing. And then I want to just re emphasize something that Pedro said, which I think is so important that those programs between private and public that we can establish, if we continue to do individually, they're going to be time bound. They won't have, they have impact, but they don't have impact on the long run. So um, I can share one quick example from a university and I'm not going to name the country or the university, but I said, we got funding a half a million dollar for researching a very important topic. We had excellent findings and then we taught 50 farmers about it. Those are not sustainable systems. What we're talking about here is uh, building infrastructure, but also building inside systems that can be maintained over years so that uh, farmers can participate. I think uh, really if I, um, this is a key insight for me coming out of this discussion that we need to put those efforts together to build sustainable learning systems uh, together. Gracias, Claudia. De, sí, importantísimo. Thank la, you so very much, Claudia. Yes, certainly, sustainability of the processes, the recurring nature, so that they can support each other and maintain themselves over time. Now I would like to ask Luca, now that uh, Claud Claudia mentioned this, Luca, what do you think the, ro the role of universities would be in a future roadmap? What would be the fundamental role here of, of, of universities? Basically to add a bit to Claudia's example, what, 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 uh, what do you think we could add to this roadmap for universities? Universities in, in the areas, right? Like the university in the rural areas of the countries yeah. or, or external universities devising projects to collaborate with local universities. Bueno, creo que sería bonito conocer un poquito I believe la... it would be good to know a bit about both. <laughs> because we, we were trying to do like, for instance, in, in, uh, with my university I mean, here in Canada is to try to uh, well, get a, a little bit of money from grants to establish some partnerships with universe, with local universities. Speci this was specifically done in a community in Africa, but we will try to do exactly the same in, uh, uh, in some communities in Latin America to uh, basically um, try to somehow teach them or yeah, get them accustomed to the use of digital technologies in, in some classes or how to uh, improve and modernize the way of teaching specific subjects in, spe in specific type of classes. Uh, this is a pilot that we're now trying to do with the University of Zambia, with my university and the University of Zambia to see how they react to modernizing the way of teaching specific uh, subjects in a more digitalized way. And I think this is potentially something that could be, uh, if successful, scaled at the level of more universities, but also scaled at the level of more countries, in this case, Latin America, in some Latin America univer uh, universities in rural areas. So I think there's definitely room for interventions or uh, partnerships between uh, be between universities, and that uh, that's the direction that at least I myself am taking personally, and pro even promoting. Like I'm applying myself for specific grants that encourage these type of partnerships with local universities in rural areas, both in Africa and Latin America. So I think this is a uh, this is a relatively easy route that we could follow to. Uh, promote, let's say, digital skills uh, across universities. Muchas gracias, Luca. Thank you, Luca. Now, before we start wrapping up this session, I would like to leave some time, for example, for uh, Claudia to elaborate a bit more on the concept of precision agriculture for development. Now that uh, Don Pedro mentioned it, and with this, we can start wrapping up our session. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you. 
precision agriculture for development. This is a model that means reaching farmers in rural areas through mobile telephones. So our model is truly simple. The idea of an intervention at a low cost. Just to give you an idea, these interventions at the end of 2020 would cost $1.31 per farmer per year. And we are reaching 3.8 million farmers in nine different countries. Together with ICA, we are beginning operations now in Latin America this year. So our model is to work for example, with local universities who are ex ex content experts to identify practices that will have a, a bigger impact on farmers. We select some of these practices and we work with uh, economy and behavior and other techniques to design messages so that are easy to understand, easy to implement, and that can uh, cause a great change. Our impact or as some estimates say, it is about 4% increase in productivity. And perhaps 4% may sound somewhat low, but it is 4% at $1.30 per year per farmer. So once you see that, the impact is huge. And as we increase the number of farmers we reach, our, our final cost will reduce significantly. So the cost of entry into a new project or a new a country is relatively high, but each additional producer will lower that uh, average cost. So this is a model we expect to begin in Colombia and Brazil this year with, with the ICA. Thank you, thank you so much, Claudia. How important it is to know a bit about uh, this uh, projection shoes to better uh, understand this, uh, e even for me as decision makers, uh, uh, this is, it, it is very good to have this broader notion. Unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, for this forum and for this opportunity for this discussion. This is a, has been a very rich discussion, very useful, not only as a moderator, but I mean, as a participant here, I have learned so much and I hope the same applies to all participants, both the other, the panelists, as well as uh, all our viewers. Uh, I hope you have taken advantage of this forum and have been able to broaden your views and perspectives uh, thanks to this. I thank you all very much for your participation, for the effort, for the interest to make such valuable contributions, so uh, aware and knowledge and understanding the reality in Latin America. So with this, I would like to offer the floor to Emmanuel. Thank you so very much. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, thank you to each one of you. Mr. Vice Minister, thank you for your moderation. Excellent panel, very enriching. To begin the closing ceremony, I would like to offer the floor with our Director General, Dr. Manuel Otero. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. I reiterate uh, my greetings to all of you, and I apologize for my enthusiasm earlier. I started to talk when I wasn't supposed to. Fortunately, in this case, I was shut up just in time. <laughs> so that was good, having colleagues that are friends. No, I was remembering there was a president of Argentina, unnamed, when in some closing remarks, he started to say, to speak, and he realized it was the wrong uh, speech. I hope in my case, it was not the wrong speech, but it was the, the wrong point of time in the agenda though. So what I was starting to say before, and I highlight this, these are times for intercooperation, times for public-private partnerships, times for actions, where actions have to be more important than words. And in this sense, as IICA, I always say when I end a seminar, well, what is the next step? Now what? Uh, what will be the agenda beginning tomorrow? That is what is of most interest to me, because I insist IICA as an institution of dialogue that reflects 
a, a plurality in ideas, but always focusing on actions we need to act, because it is very difficult for countries to pay their uh, uh, fees at ICA. But let me give you some news, good news. Most of you are up to date, and that re reinforces our commitment. So to talk about concrete actions, the first thing I would like to say is that together with Microsoft and with Bayer, we are going to continue with our Center for the Interpretation of the Tomorrow of Agriculture. Those of you that can come to our headquarters can see that it is growing. There's a lot of demand here, Claudia. And we want that Interpretation Center to be uh, a a springboard to take technology to rural areas. And we want it to be a major education project and encourage new populations, and sh showing them that there are opportunities for progress and growth in rural communities, that new disciplines are needed, and new knowledge. And that is an, an, an icon of the Open Doors IICA that we want to push forward strongly. So I really thank you very much for this partnership. Mention was made of precision agriculture development. And as the other Claudia said, we are ready to begin both in Brazil as well as in Colombia. In both cases, we're talking about 100,000 small producers, 100,000 small producers in the case of Brazil. This is for the Northeastern area, which is an area that has usually been lagging, but this entails a tremendous opportunity. Minister Teresa de, uh, from Brazil has taken this very seriously, and she has as objective to come with this proposal of rural extension based on cellular telephony. She wants to reach 3 million producers. In the case of Colombia, the launching will be, I believe, in July. And uh, the president of the Republic is supposedly to be president. Present, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Navarro, will be there. And I'm sure other countries will join. Hopefully, the IDB or with the IDB, we could have the necessary interaction so that this proposal of rural extension sh should not abandon a, a normal or traditional extension, but is, is something that we can instead expand throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Allow me to say we will continue with our studies in uh, partnership with Microsoft and the IDB. You all spoke about the importance and need of strengthening digital skills of the people in rural areas. So possibly next week, we will be launching a new study on the development of skills for rural digital inclusion in Latin America and the Caribbean. We will continue to strengthening our Fab Lab, the first lab, Fab Lab, focused on digital agriculture, allow me to say there are at least five or six countries that want to replicate this model. And I, I, I am very happy about that. And I thank the Ministry of Science and Technology of Costa Rica, of course. This would not be possible without them. We would not have been advanced, been able to advance with something like this, where we are trying to exhibit an ECA with a different face. We have ended a pilot program of the Internet of Things in Agriculture precisely for Costa Rica. So allow me to announce also that we want to launch a pro hemispheric program of the IoT for Agriculture, because there, there is a very interesting niche where I believe we can advance in partnership with Semfotec, a private university uh, based here in Costa Rica, and we want to project this throughout the entire hemisphere. Allow me to make some comments about research. Uh, as uh, the Dean of the University of New Mexico mentioned, because precisely, uh, I believe three days ago, I was at a Fontagro meeting where we were discussing 
sustainable agriculture issues. Evidently, there we have a, an issue. In Latin America and the, con and the Caribbean, we are investing, ve being very generous, $1 for every $100 produced in agriculture, whereas developed countries are or maybe reaching about $3 for every $100 produced. So aside from investing very little, the problem is that we concentrate most of those efforts on sanitary emergencies or very specific uh, issues related to crops, but there is very little on a sustainable agriculture. And I would dare say there is nothing or almost nothing in digital agriculture, in digital inclusion. And I'm fully convinced that the future of our countries must include strengthening our national systems. I have science and technology, obviously, uh, proposing regional strategies. ICA is the Secretariat of, of, of Foragro. We are linked to Fontagro, but digital agriculture there has to be ever more important. And here, I share that concern with all of you. Today, we would, we would like to announce an initiative, which I believe is one more step in this partnership between ICA and the University of Cordoba, Spain. And that is our support to a master's in digital transformation for the agri-food sector and forestry sector. With a major objective that we uh, 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 mentioned during the panel, to train leaders that can foster this uh, movement, digital movement, and offer development opportunities for the agri-food and forestry sectors. With us today, our friends and representatives of that dear university, which will, in a moment, explain what that master's is all about and how we can access it. What we would like to offer in the framework of this partnership with the University of Cordoba is our network of 34 offices in each and every one of the countries in the inter-American system. We want to do a lot of marketing because we want we feel that in the Americas we, we need many more trained professionals trained in these new disciplines. And this is an undeniable need. This is not something for tomorrow or the day after. No, this is for now. So we are fully convinced that this partnership is going to be a win-win situation. And obviously we are willing to give the best of ICA for this relationship to be successful and uh, at the same level as the new challenges. So I would like to offer the floor of Roja Gallardo, Director of the Agronomic Engineering uh, uh, School of the University of Cordoba, who will refer to the importance of this university to have students from the Americas and what could be some uh, uh, work opportunities. Uh, so, Rosa, please. Good morning from ICA headquarters. I offer you the floor. Well, thank you so very much, Manuel. Good afternoon in Spain. Good day to all of you. Good morning. Special greetings to the Director General of ICA and all the staff and all participants. Thank you so very much to participate in this session, closing this forum to speak about an initiative which I can believe will drive this digital uh, change we need to guarantee the future uh, rural territories and agriculture. First of all, congratulations on the success of this effort. The messages have been outstanding for us. It has been a great pleasure to present this partnership today that the Director General referred to between two institutions that share the commitment to contribute to improve a sector which is strategic for society overall and the economy of these countries. The ties between uh, Siam and the University of Cordoba and ICA are tremendous. We have a whole track record of uh, training and participation in agriculture and innovation, rural development, agri-food, but even more important is mutual trust. And that is what can help us move forward to turn that desired digital transformation 
of the agricultural sector into a reality. As has been said, we have a different and diverse challenges the agriculture sector is, focused, is facing and uh, where we see digital transformation, which is no longer a strategy or an option. It is a strategy of survival for agriculture and for the agri-food sector. This is a reality and part of the sector, but to reach the small, medium and large growers in all areas and producers in all areas is a big challenge, a challenge where technology is not the end in itself, but instead a means to make better decisions and improve the reality of producers and their uh, production agro-industry in the rural territories also. Advances in technology are enormous. We have mentioned significant obstacles that prevent to advance in the process for digital transformation. We have spoken about uh, uh, connectivity, availability of data, the implementation of a, co uh, a culture of cooperation, uh, sharing data, and it has been essential to have adequate training of all the actors involved directly or indirectly in the agri-food chain. So I believe we need new professionals that accept the importance of this deep process of innovation at the agri-food level with competencies in agriculture and digital knowledge also sufficient digital knowledge to go along with the sector in this challenge of digital transformation. And this is the proposal that Ica and Siam at the University of Cordoba are, are preparing for today. Basically a digital uh, effort to offer a postgraduate degree to decision makers and technical experts from the agriculture sector, both in uh, Spain as well as in Latin America and this Caribbean. And uh, we will hear more details about this in a moment, but this will help us break away with these barriers to adapt technology and adapt, uh, 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 adopt uh, these changes to move forward together. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Rosa, and to continue with this session and the launch of this master's degree program, we will share a brief video explaining the details. Reality, by 2050, we will be 75 billion people need to produce 60% more with less land. Challenge in, to increase productivity, and intensify and sustainability. Digital Agri, New Times, New Answers. This master's degree comes from a real demand of companies looking for professionals that are not available in the market. With this master's program, the University of Cordoba is addressing a demand by the productive sector and business sector. It is essential to have new professionals that are committed to this digital transformation of the sector. We offer our students specialized education with great quality that will surely give them more opportunities to be employed. A double master's in agricultural engineering and Montes engineering masters, we have added digital uh, skills for our master's degrees. The strength is that we have a multidisciplinary team of professors, professionals from the most innovative sector, businesses in the sector. We train our students with disruptive technologies. We work with real cases, innovation, digitalization, and technologies. The Internet of Things, data analysis, cloud computing, data processing and architecture, satellite imaging and advanced analysis of these, sensors for food, soil, water, plants, big data and supercomputing, blockchain and traceability, systems to support decision making. Our priority is to create value to have our students come closer to businesses by adopting technological improvements in the sector. 
with Latin America and the Caribbean, we share our commitment to train and educate so that we advance in the digital transformation of the agroforestry and agri-food industry. At AICA, we are part of this initiative by the University of Cordoba in Spain with a master's degree on digital transformation for the agricultural sector. We are convinced that this will ensure greatest relevance to create a new generation of professionals in this field. Thank you. I'd now I'd like to give the floor to the director of this master's program, Mr. Adolfo Peña. Good afternoon, dear Emmanuel. It's great to greet you again. And also Mr. Vice Minister and all the speakers. Thank you so much for giving us the, the time. I will be brief as we've already heard a lot. It's uh, first of all, I have to congratulate the speakers. It's been truly interesting. Uh, I have to say I agree with uh, everything that you have brought to the table. It's also the types of things we are considering over here. I'd like to tell uh, the director general that was looking at time that was worried about the weather. We are at 17 degrees Celsius at uh, 16 hours of the afternoon. It's got some soft rain. So our wheat and cereals are starting to take strength and our uh, cherry blossoms are blooming. And so soon all this water will become oil for all of you, which is so wonderful. We do agriculture, nothing else. We are always looking at the time and the weather and uh, the evolution of this sector. How this master's degree comes about, as we heard from uh, the master's director, has been a natural evolution. The uh, agricultural associations themselves or businesses were asking for this. They were demanding professionals that were not available in the market uh, yet. Someone that had close knowledge to the agricultural and livestock sector, but that also needed to have certain skills to handle this great uh, amount of data that is available now for the first time in so many years. Some is done remotely through large worldwide programs, satellites that provide information with great resolution and uh, almost in real time, but then also uh, more deployment of sensors that is now more affordable and different types of applications available now for management and uh, communication of data. So as we've heard today, there are still weaknesses in terms of access, connectivity, use or availability of devices. We have to progress on this. So along with the business sector, we decided to start certain actions about five years ago and two years back, we started with this master's degree program. The profile of our students is essentially that students that have knowledge and training in agricultural engineering linked to agriculture in the sector that we want to uh, train in data management. We have 10 modules in the training that include everything from capture, storage, treatment, modeling, and decision-making with, with data from different sources available. We started la uh, in November, we start every November. So this coming November will be a third year for this master's program. It's an official master's. This means it's verified in the university sector of Europe. It has access to doctor's degree programs later. We have class uh, in the afternoons from November to May in Spain. And during the week, uh, the students work personally to cover all the subjects. We have a property of 160 hectares that can be used to put into practice all of this technology. And as we've heard this afternoon, because of the pandemic, we had to change a lot of our patterns. So we like to have at least one stay in May for two to four weeks that anyone can come to uh, visit us uh, and, and it's affordable, and the rest is online. So it's semi-presential, semi-virtual, with uh, professors here uh, connecting online and some people uh, in physically, but uh, everyone tends to do it virtually, although the May uh, stay physically is, of course, very useful. It's a public system of access in our university, so we have 
uh, registration for uh, students. We select the best candidates. The candidates can send their applications at about July. Um, and it depends on the public university's date for applications. But in any case, we are very glad to have this alliance and to have this support. We are fully uh, encouraged to put all our efforts here to see the fruits of this and to help contribute and learn from the professionals that can come from all of Latin America and the Caribbean, hopefully. Without anything further, I truly thank you for this opportunity. And of course, if you need any more information, you can go to our website, digitalagri.es, or contact us, and we will be glad to share any information with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Before we uh, continue with our closing, I'd like to share the floor with Mr. Gonzalo Marin, CEO of Ismatec. Mr. Marin. Good afternoon, good day, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. It's wonderful to be able to greet all these experts and authorities joining us in this forum. Thank you to Siam and the University of Cordoba for um, letting us share our experience with the Digital Agri Master's degree now that it will begin its uh, third year. We are a technological company with 35 years now digitalizing uh, farmers and uh, livestock farmers throughout the world. Saw no other op option but to participate in this so interesting educational action to bring together the agricultural and technological worlds, which has been our reason for being as a company. And what's also incredible and wonderful about this uh, educational approach that is so practical and covers so many skills for young people that already have studied agriculture engineering is that uh, we don't just uh, value it uh, being a company that works in the agri-food sector, but especially in those who require it most are producers themselves and producers companies. Some of them are already part of this master's degree as uh, partners, and they're the ones that uh, tell us, please take these people that uh, are ready for continuing their education, and we have them on projects uh, with our professors from the, uh, the CM school, and we want to be sure that projects are proposed where those skills that they acquired can add value and help digitalize uh, agricultural companies. In our experience, our companies, our clients who are uh, different uh, agri-food sector businesses, cooperatives in Spain, uh, have seen a symbiosis in this transfer of knowledge in the connection between the world of research, universities, and companies. It's excellent. And because we live off data, and it seems that the world, or at least the, the part of it, a rational side of our brain needs data, I'll give you a few facts. Of five students that we have received in the first two years of our master's degrees, all five have been employed. So we do not see this as a, a way that some uh, of the students uh, become interns and then the company has to find other ways. You no, know, for us, it is so natural to just come after their education into employment. They start very practically to engage and to approach the productive professional sector, it's just automatic for them to smoothly venture into professionals and to being employed. Their skills they have learned are easily put into production and they are leveraged. And the ones that value it most, and again, ask us again, when will you have more students graduating from digital agri. We need more of them to work with us. This is because we have a very proactive approach. Because we are a technological business, we don't uh, want our students to remain here. We want them to go to the producers to work on digital transformation and digital 
pro problems for agriculture and the industry in this new era. Therefore, just to say that we need the, the agri-food world and, and producers and the different companies uh, um, working in the sector and all the ag tech companies need more initiatives such as the one that has been jointly developed with Siam and the University of Cordoba. It is absolutely the best of any scenario when we started thinking about this and we talked about the need to have agro technologists or agri techy engineers. And today we have this digital agri master's degree. It's the only one that is providing this type of professionals. And we can say this uh, surely because we work on several uh, areas with uh, small farmers, cooperatives and others. So congratulations on this wonderful alliance. And thank you so much, Raika, to steer this with Siam. And of course, we're open to all types of collaborations. And hopefully we can continue along this road because it's a great collaboration between the academic world, the research world and private companies in this case, uh, technological agri-food businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. And to close, I give the floor to our Director General, Doctor. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. I would just like to very especially recognize all of you as partners and friends who participated in this forum. Thank you to the team at AICA led by Emmanuel Pecado and Eliana Palmieri. I'm very, very satisfied with the work we've done. And the most important thing is what comes next tomorrow, a clear roadmap with more commitments, more engagement to move forward. There's two guiding principles for everything we do. The first is that we won't really move forward if each of us works on their own. Uh, we need to find a way to collaborate, to work together as teams. So you have to know in that sense that AICA is a small, humble institution that is at your service, at the service of this great coalition for transformation. And the second principle is no one should be left behind. We've already heard this uh, from some of you. We need to transform our rural areas into areas of progress, opportunity, where we can have our young people coming back to our rural areas with better training so that we don't have to read about uh, migration, poverty, exclusion. And, and in that sense, we continue on as AICA and having a clear roadmap with clear consensus helps us all for that. So I reiterate my gratitude and I and the decision of moving along this path together as friends. Thank you and have a good day. Gracias nuevamente. Gracias, director. Buenos días. Muchas gracias. Adiós, buenos días.